Hey, g'day, it's Preso. Thanks for joining me in the workshop today. Now, I haven't posted a video in quite a while and part of the reason for that is that we've had a month of absolutely terrible weather. It rained just about every day uh, for the past month and I keep a log of our rainfall and I don't know if you can see that up there but at the top of the screen it says that we had 705 millimeters of rain in May. That's about 28 inches in the old units and part of the problem in this workshop is that above me I've got a single skin metal roof with uh, very little insulation. So when it rains like that, uh, the noise drowns out any conversation I'm likely to have to the camera right here. So I just abandoned uh, any of that uh, filming that I was going to do last month and I decided to hold it over until the weather improved, which it has. Now, uh, as part of that rainfall that we had, there are a lot of people who got flooded out of their homes around this district. We're very fortunate where we live. We're on a bit of a slope uh, on the edge of a sort of a ridge and uh, we don't get flooded, but the ground gets absolutely saturated. And I went for a walk up to the back of the block um, about a week ago and my feet were just sinking into what essentially was just a, a swamp. <laughs> So um, it's starting to dry out now and it's a lot more pleasant and uh, we're able to walk around without wearing boots. Now the other reason I wasn't able to do any video last month is that we had visitors staying and they were here for around about five weeks. They went home today, which uh, cleared my schedule and meant that I was able to get back down in the workshop and make videos. Now I haven't been sitting on my bum doing nothing. I've had other projects happening in the background and I'll show you a few of those shortly and then we're going to talk about the main topic today which is uh, a project that I was involved with when I was teaching. Now some of you may know that I was an industrial technology teacher for all of my career and I got involved in a STEM project that's science, technology, engineering and maths and it was something I was very passionate about and I thought I'd share some of that with you today. And then in the next video that I do, we're going to get on with a proper workshop project. Now, I've also got some new stickers, so we might look at those first and I'll show you these other little side projects that I've had going on. Okay, here's our first one. This comes from James Quick or Jim's Workshop on YouTube. Here's a picture of Jim's uh, homepage on YouTube. And Jim's into steam engines, hot air engines, model boilers. He's got a lovely little Emco Unimap lathe and he makes some interesting models out of unusual devices <laughs> and uh, for a home workshop he does some pretty interesting stuff so certainly check his out if you're into that sort of model engineering type of project okay here's our next one this comes from doug lester at the metalworks machine shop here's a picture of his home page on youtube now doug's got a lovely kearney and trekker milling machine also a cnc plasma cutter and a vintage Colchester lathe. So obviously a very discerning collector of vintage machine tools. So in my view, he's a good bloke. And uh, he's got uh, quite a large workshop and I'm actually quite jealous of the space that he has to work in. And it's hard to pinpoint exactly the sort of thing that he works on because it's very diverse. Okay, this is the last uh, batch of stickers that came in. Now uh, this comes from Dan Book. Uh, Dan's got a website called bookautoworks.com and his YouTube channel is just called Book Auto Works. And honestly, he's the hairiest guy I've ever seen on YouTube. That's him. But hey, if he got it, flaunt it. That's what I say. Now, I looked at this car and uh, it looked kind of familiar, but I couldn't quite put my finger on which one it was. And honestly, I'm not a car guy. I mean, I drive a 2010 Camry, for God's sake. But uh, when I looked at this, I thought, yeah, I'd, I'd love to find out what that is. So I checked it out and I actually... Uh, I think I picked it correctly, but Dan sent me an email. I'm going to read from his email here. He said, yes, the blue car on that sticker is a 1987 Bertoni X1-9. Uh, now, it was designed by Marcello Gandini, and he was Bertoni's chief designer at the time. Now, he's credited with some of the most beautiful designs like the Lamborghini Muria and the Alfa Romeo Montreal, and some really wild ones like the Lancia Stratos and the Lamborghini Countach. Now, uh, like I say, if you're into cars and uh, automobiles in general, then Dan's your guy. Uh, here's his homepage on YouTube, and uh, he's got an interesting style. He's, he's a good presenter. It's, it's worth just looking just for his presentation style. 
So there it is, uh, book auto works, and that's the end of stickers for today. Now I said I was working on some projects, uh, these are side projects, I didn't think it was worth putting these into videos on their own. But this is the first one, uh, I had to replace the CNC controller for my little SIG X3 milling machine. The original controller was getting very long in the tooth, it was starting to become unreliable and I figured it was about time to replace it with something a little bit more modern. Now what I've decided to do is to go totally with the one company for all of the hardware and software for the machine. So I got all of this from CNC Drive. So inside the controller I've got a C11G breakout board and I've got a UC100 motion controller at the back of this orange box here. And the software I'm using now is UC CNC. So it's all from the same company and the idea was that it would all play together nicely. And so far it has. Uh, this was relatively easy to set up, way easier than Mac 3 and Mac 4. And uh, I've got a new keyboard. This is a compact keyboard, but I've got a cover on there to keep the chips out. So when I'm machining, I just keep that closed. Uh, the CNC controller, I posted some pictures on Instagram, what I had in mind. I had some very good advice from various people about how to set out the inside of this box. So I took all of that advice and I've used cable way to keep the cable management under control. I bought one of those little crimping tools to use uh, to terminate all of the cables. So I've got ferrules on the end of all the cables. And what was the other? Oh, I used shielded cable from the stepper controllers to the, the switches or at least the plugs on the back of the machine. So I've used this type of aviation plug for all of the connections on the back there. And I've also bought myself a new probe. Now I got this one from AliExpress and it's got a very cool little uh, green and red LED inside it. So you can see visually when you touch it off against the part and that's all working and the uh, most uh, most impressive thing about this setup is how quiet the whole machine is now so I can just show you if we just uh, we'll just jog it in Y and that is way way quieter than what I used to have and that's jogging about 63 percent so I'm totally happy with that all of the homing works now and uh, in this, uh, this case, this was all custom made from sheet aluminium stock. It's all been powder coated and uh, all of the front and back panel I've done with uh, laser etched two ply plastic. So yep, all working, super happy with that. Hopefully you see that in a future video. Okay, here is the other project that I've been working on. Uh, this is a handrail and balustrade for an exterior ramp on the back of our house and this house was built in 1990 and all of this work was originally done in Australian hardwood but be because it's totally exposed to the weather I've already had to replace that wood twice and I didn't want to be doing it again so I've used materials that as far as I can gather are as durable as, as I could possibly get them so this uh, handrail here is aluminium tubing the posts are galvanized steel and this cap on top of the post is that composite decking material. These castings, I made those at home here, they were cord castings. Once the cores come out, the tubing slides through there. All of this aluminium will eventually be powder coated and the posts and everything else are going to be painted. Now the thing about this is that everything is bespoke, as Kevin McLeod loves to say. And that meant that uh, I couldn't buy very much of this off the shelf. It all had to be made to fit. And because the posts went into the original stirrups that the hardwood posts went into, uh, nothing is exact. There's slight differences in the spacings and the heights and everything else. So it all had to be made and fitted on site. But we're getting close and uh, I'm hoping that once this is done, I'll never have to go there again. <laughs> this is... Uh, this is it. This has got to outlast me. Okay, on with the subject of today's video. Now, a while ago I showed a cabinet up in my house and in the cabinet I had a collection of models that I had made and some that I collected over the years. And a few people had asked if I was going to do a sort of a show and tell about the contents of that cabinet. Well, this is part of it. And the title of the video, Little Wooden Cars, is partly due to the fact that these two cars are made of you know, about 90% wood. 
So this one here is made of balsa wood and this one here is made of a hardwood called milky pine. Now this is a CO2 dragster and this one here is an F1 in schools car. Now both of these cars were made as part of competitions that were held in secondary schools and they were part of what we call a STEM project. Now STEM is science, technology, engineering and maths. And the idea of these competitions is to encourage young people into considering careers in engineering and manufacturing. So I'm going to talk about the CO2 dragster first and uh, then we'll get on to the topic of the F1 schools car. Okay, the CO2 dragster gets its name from the fact that it's powered by one of these cylinders of compressed CO2 gas. Now it fits into a hole in the back of the car and the membrane on the back of the cylinder is pierced with a, an electric firing pin. Now the gas ejects out of the nozzle of that cylinder there and accelerates the car from zero to roughly 80 kilometers an hour in about 0.1 of a second. Now the race track is an elevated two lane track and the cars are guided down the track by a pair of eyelets that are screwed into the bottom of the car. And a nylon tether is passed through those eyelets and that keeps the car running straight. There's a runoff area at the end of the track and the cars decelerate in that runoff area by actually running into a folded up uh, towel. So basically the nose of the car hits that towel which is placed over the tether and uh, that decelerates the car. So the race itself is very violent. Um, <laughs> when the firing pin pierces that cylinder there's a huge cloud of compressed CO2 gas vapor and the, uh, there's a, a, a large uh, noise from the escaping gas and uh, the whole race is over in just over one second. So it's very, very quick and uh, it's quite exciting to watch. So the way this used to run was uh, we would actually run this with year nine students in a woodworking class. Kids were given a wooden blank and they were given a booklet. Uh, in the booklet they could draw a series of thumbnail sketches of what they thought the car might look like. There was also a list of specifications and that would outline the overall length of the car, it had minimum, maximum, uh, same for the height of the car, same for the diameter of the wheels. There were a whole series of dimensions with tolerances that they had to actually get that car to sit within. And once they'd uh, refined the design of the car, it was drawn onto a paper template. The template was glued onto the wooden blank and it was sawn out on a bandsaw. Now once that was done, the students took over and they would do the rest of the shaping by hand with files and rasps and sandpaper. And then finally they'd prep it for paint, do the painting and they could add whatever decoration they want to the car. Now the wheels were actually supplied to the students. They were an injection molded pair of wheels, uh, roughly the size of these ones that you see here. And this is a car that I made for the teachers class of the competition. This is one that I made. Now this went away to the state competition and the national competition. It won the national competition and uh, it was very, very quick. It was the actual, the last car that I made before I retired. Now this one here was one that I made, I think it was about two years before that. This one was CNC machined on a Denford three axis router. And uh, this one went away to the national competition. It got a perfect score, 100 points, and it won the competition. <laughs> so uh, I was very, very proud of this design here. Uh, the wheels and axles on this are very special. Now these are machined from aluminium billet. Uh, they're extremely light. They're almost uh, like paper thin on the wall of the, the wheel. And the axles are trapped between a pair of pins that are adjustable. So on one side, there's a tiny little screw head. I don't know if you can see that there. And you can adjust that screw and that will pinch the axle between a pair of uh, 60 degree conical centers. And by careful adjustment, you can make those wheels run literally as free as that. They'll just run and run and run. I took this out of the cabinet. I haven't lubricated it. When I first made it, you could spin that up with compressed air and it would run for like minutes. So it has very little rolling resistance and the, the shape was designed to be as minimal as possible looking from the front. So, uh, you know, drag reduction is a big part of the competition. We try to teach students about uh, basic aerodynamics. We teach them about 
engineering principles, uh, drag, uh, mass. We talk about you know trying to incorporate uh, design features that make the car very lightweight, uh, but also very strong because the deceleration force on these will snap a car if this middle section is too thin. So that was an important part of actually uh, discovering the design that's going to work the best. So there's CO2 Dragsters. Uh, it was a really, really fun competition. We used to take the kids over the hall, had roughly 100 kids taking part. We'd put some rock music on, had some flashing lights, and we'd run that all day. And like I say, the, the fastest five cars from our school would go to the state competition and then the fastest five in our state would go to the national competition. So our school did extremely well in this competition. We had a lot of experience with it and uh, the kids were very passionate about making these little cars. So there, the CO2 dragsters. Okay, this is an F1 in schools car. Now F1 in schools is once again a STEM competition. It runs here in Australia. It also runs internationally and every year, or at least until COVID took over, there has been a national competition. It's hosted by various different countries. And this is a like a, a CO2 car on steroids. So in order for students to compete in this competition, they have to form into teams. It's, it is a team uh, represented sport. And this particular car was the last one that I made with a group of students. There were five of them on the team one, two, three, four, five, all the names are on the car. And this one was raced in a national competition uh, held in Victoria in 2013. Now, I, I haven't got all day, unfortunately, I could talk about this forever. <laughs> uh, but this competition is more than just building the car. In this competition, the students have to, as I say, form into teams, they have to have a team uniform, they have to create a pit display they have to work with collaborative partners so to find industries or individuals they can work with and collaborate with to come up with uh, certain design features on the car. They have to do an eight minute verbal presentation, the whole team, and they have to produce a 20 page uh, design folio. Now, also during the competition, the cars are raced multiple times. So they're raced first of all in a time trial format where the cars are fired automatically and the time is recorded. From there, the cars are seated and the next phase of the competition is where a student, one student from the team, will do a reaction time race. Now, in this version of the race, the students are given a button and they have to watch the five staging lights on the uh, display of the start panel. And then just like a regular Formula One race, when all five lights go out, you press the button and that fires the car. So reaction times vary around about, usually about 0.2 of a second. And these cars are generally way faster than the CO2 dragsters. So they're, uh, they're all CNC machined. The cars have to be made in multiple pairs. So sometimes two or three cars have to be made. They have to be made identically. And uh, the cars have a much more stringent set of specifications they have to work to. And if you miss any of those specifications, if you go outside the uh, tolerances on those dimensions, you'll either get a point penalty or a time penalty. Now, a time penalty is basically the end of your racing. It, it was it used to be 0.1 of a second. And with the margins on these uh, race times, that basically puts you out of the competition. So that's, uh, that's one that I took to a competition. It's a beautiful little car. It's, uh, it's beautifully detailed. Paint work on it was done by a professional. And the wheels and axles on this car are very special, but I haven't got time to talk about it. These are machined from aluminium and they've been, I think they're aluminium. Yeah, they're aluminium. They've been uh, black anodized. And the bearings in these wheels are synthetic sapphire ring jewels. They're the same sort of uh, bearings that are put into watches and scientific instruments. Front wing is 3D printed, the back wing is 3D printed, glued onto the balsa wood body. And these, uh, the machining processes to make these cars, usually there are four different machining operations. So they're machined from either side, from the top and from underneath to get that profile. So that's one. Uh, I've got a couple more here. 
Okay, this is another one. This is uh, the very first uh, team car that I took to a national competition. So the students that worked on this, uh, I think it was back in 2005, and uh, they took it to the national competition. They actually won their category of the national competition, but due to a number of reasons, they were unable to take it to the international competition. But the thing about this car is it's all modelled using a program called Katia and uh, the student who designed this did it all with one single lofted profile. So if you've done any CAD modeling before, you might know how difficult it is to work with, uh, with lofted profiles. The student who did this was extremely clever and he worked it out so that apart from the, the pockets, which are actually the holes for the axles, all of the other features were contained in that one single lofted profile. So very, very clever boy. Here's a couple more. This was a uh, little car which was uh, meant to reflect the space shuttle uh, aesthetic, <laughs> hence the name. Uh, the name actually, NASA, was the Noosa Aerodynamic Specialist Association. And uh, that little car there was made by a very young team and uh, they unfortunately weren't eligible for any of the state competition prizes, but they attracted a lot of attention with their design of that competition. Okay, here's another one that we made. This uh, went to a, a national competition in South Australia and the team that made this one were called High Voltage Racing. Uh, same team, that did this one here a year later. Uh, you can see the car colour is a common theme with these cars. And this one is a two to one scale model. Now the reason we used to make them two to one is that you could put this on the pit display and when people walk past you could pick up the car and discuss it, point out features of the design and so on. And it just attracted a bit more attention than the regular size car. Now once again, just for comparison, that's the size car that gets raced and this is the one that we used to have on the pit display. So this was all machined from balsa wood. The, the wheels were actually machined from MDF and uh, it was all done on the same little Denford 3-axis CNC router. The software we used to design this one was Autodesk Inventor and that's sort of where I got my start uh, when I, before I started this uh, F1 Schools competition I knew nothing about uh, high-end uh, CAD modeling and through teaching this unit it actually taught me a lot about CAD and also CNC. So for me anyway it was uh, it was a it's very, very steep learning curve to get involved with this. But there, F1 and Schools cars, I'm going to show you a little montage of footage that I've taken at competitions over the years and also some photos. Uh, one of the competitions I went to was the World Championships held in London in 2009. At that competition, I took a collaboration team, which was uh, four students from Australia, two from Canada. I worked with a Canadian teacher over there and we placed third in the world and we won our collaboration trophy. We were actually the best collaboration team there. And as part of that, because we got on the podium, we were able to go to uh, McLaren F1 Technology Center, it was called. We also met Lewis Hamilton. It was just an amazing time. <laughs> we also went to Red Bull Technology Center. Uh, we got a look around London. We went to some famous landmarks there. We had two days in Paris. So despite all of the work that went into this competition, and, and I mean, for me anyway, it was like having two jobs. So I used to do my regular teaching job, and then I would come home and I'd work on this because it was largely extracurricular. But uh, I didn't, uh, didn't regret it for a moment. It was uh, one of the highlights of my career and something I'll never forget. And I worked with some amazing students, very, very clever kids, and I met some amazing people along the way. So that's it, that's uh, F1 of Schools and CO2 Dragsters. Uh, let's just look at a little montage now. Might throw some music in and then I'll catch at the end. I'll talk, talk to you about the real reason why this video is called Little Wooden Cars. <laughs>
there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. I know it's a bit long-winded uh, and it's not normally what I do on my channel, but the topic came up and I thought it'd be fun to address it. Now, you might also be wondering what was the other reason why I called this video Little Wooden Cars. Now, the thing was, I was involved with the F1 in Schools competition for about 10 years and it was a lot of work. Uh, a lot of it was done during my own time. I lost count of the number of times I put my hand in my own pocket to buy materials and tools and equipment for students to use. But I could see the long game. I could see why it was important to provide these programs for students. And often that went unrecognised. Um, and the reason why I called Little Wooden Cars is that I was walking through the school grounds one day and a teacher called me over and they said, hey, I was talking to one of your students the other day and they showed me the little wooden car they were making. That's brilliant, you know, I love that you're making these little wooden cars. And I thought, oh really, that's, that's about 10% of what we do. <laughs> the other 90% was the really important stuff. So yes, making the cars was fun and they looked great and the kids got a kick out of taking them home and showing their parents and their friends and so on. But that was, like I say, about 10%. The 90% was the more important part. And that was learning about engineering, learning about working with uh, other students and their team, working with adults, um, visiting places, seeing what engineering does in our world today and how important it is. So yeah, I used to get tired of hearing about the little wooden cars. <laughs> So anyway, that's it for today. Uh, thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoyed it. Next time in the workshop, I'm gonna be making things. So we're gonna do some metal casting, some metal plating, some fabrication, working with some unusual materials. It's gonna be a ton of fun. So catch up with me for that one. But for today, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.